Hi everyone. Today we will discuss about depolarizing neuromuscular blockers. At the neuromuscular junction, the cholinergic nerve terminals are present which are equipped with the various number of synaptic vesicles. And each synaptic vesicle is loaded with a number of acetylcholine molecules because acetylcholine is one of the mediator in the cholinergic nerve system. Now, at the postsynaptic membrane, again we can observe few of the receptors and these receptors are the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. These nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are pentameric receptors which are made up of 5 subunits. So here you can see this alpha subunit, beta subunit, gamma subunit and again another alpha subunit and delta subunit. In this way they are made up of 5 subunits so they are pentameric in nature and they are inotropic receptor that means when they are going to be activated they will open the ion channels particularly sodium and calcium and these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are having two extracellular binding sites on which the acetylcholine can bind so in this way all the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are having two extracellular binding domains so when the action potential reaches to the presynaptic nerve terminal the cholinergic nerve terminal is depolarized which facilitates the entry of the calcium into the nerve terminal so calcium can enter into the nerve terminal which which results in the exocytosis and release of this acetylcholine within the synaptic cleft now this released acetylcholine can bind to this nicotinic acetylcholine receptors thereby it can open the sodium channels so that it can produce the depolarization in the skeletal muscle in this way acetylcholine can produce the muscle contraction but at these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, again two types of drugs are going to act to produce the muscle relaxation. So one type of drugs are the depolarizing neuromuscular blockers, which can bind to the same binding site where the acetylcholine can bind. And again after binding, they can open the sodium channels, thereby they produce the depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane. So depolarizing neuromuscular blockers act just like the acetylcholine. So initially they produce the depolarization of the skeletal muscle, but later they produce the muscle paralysis. Similarly, another type of drugs are the non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockers, which act as antagonists so that they are going to bind to the same binding site where the acetylcholine is going to bind, but this prevents the binding of the acetylcholine to these sites. In this way, non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockers prevent the cholinergic transmission so that the skeletal muscle is not depolarized. So now the neuromuscular blockers can be classified into two types by based on their mechanism of action. One is the depolarizing and another one is the non-depolarizing. Depolarizing neuromuscular blockers act like agonists at the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Initially they produce muscle contractions but later they produce the muscle paralysis. But non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockers act like antagonists at the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, thereby they prevent the cholinergic transmission and they produce the muscle paralysis. So even both produce the muscle paralysis, depolarizing drugs are acting like agonists and non-depolarizing drugs are acting like antagonists. Now today in this video we will discuss about the depolarizing neuromuscular blockers. What are the depolarizing neuromuscular blockers? Actually, we have only one drug in this category that is the saxamethonium. Saxamethonium is also called as succinylcholine. So this is the structure of the saxamethonium and the name can be derived from the three terms saxa plus myth plus onium. So here onium indicates it is having a quaternary ammonium group. You can observe a quaternary ammonium group present uh, in the saxamethonium. And the term saxa indicates it is having a succinyl moiety within the structure. And finally, myth indicates the quaternary ammonium group is made up of methyl groups. So that is a saxamethonium. So saxamethonium is a succinyl derivative forming the esters with the two molecules of the choline. Now let us see how this saxamethonium acts as a depolarizing neuromuscular blocker. Just we have seen that at the skeletal muscle, at the post membrane, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are present which are responsible for the depolarization of the skeletal muscle. And at this membrane, one type of enzymes are present, these are the acetylcholine esterase enzymes which are membrane bound, which are responsible for the rapid hydrolysis of the acetylcholine which is released within the synaptic cleft. 
Now suppose SL choline is going to be released into the synaptic cleft by exocytosis. Then few of the SL choline molecules can bind to this uh, nicotinic SL choline receptors. Thereby they can activate these receptors resulting in the opening of the sodium channels which results in the depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane. But at the same time, few of the acetylcholine molecules are rapidly metabolized by the acetylcholine esterase enzymes which are present uh, on the membrane. So the action of the acetylcholine on the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors is going to be controlled by acetylcholine esterase enzymes which produce a rapid hydrolysis. But what are the small number of acetylcholine molecules which are binding to this nicotinic, ac nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are sufficient to produce the muscle contraction. In this way, even this acetylcholine is going to be metabolized by these acetylcholine esterase enzymes, still it can produce the muscle contraction by binding to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Now let us see how this saxamethonium acts at these receptors. So saxamethonium again can bind to this uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors where acetylcholine is going to bind. And after binding these receptors, just like the acetylcholine, they can also open the sodium channels. And when this sodium is going to enter into the postsynaptic membrane, it produces the depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane. In this way, the saxamethonium produces a depolarization of the skeletal muscle so that it can produce the initial muscle contractions. But what is the action of this acetylcholine esterase enzyme on this saxamethonium? We have already seen that this acetylcholine esterase enzyme will cause the rapid hydrolysis of the acetylcholine. But what is its action on the saxamethonium? So this acetylcholine esterase enzyme cannot act on the saxamethonium because saxamethonium is a saxinyl derivative, it is not an acetyl derivative. Acetylcholine esterase enzyme is highly selective for the acetylcholine, not for the saxinyl choline. So this acetylcholine esterase enzyme cannot metabolize this saxamethonium. So saxamethonium is survived within the synaptic cleft and this can bind to this nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So by binding to these receptors, it can produce the persistent depolarization. In this way, the action of the saxamethonium is not controlled by acetylcholine esterase enzyme. So this drug can bind to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, thereby it produces a persistent depolarization. Because of this persistent depolarization, these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are desensitized. Now after the use of the saxamethonium, if acetylcholine is going to bind to these desensitized receptors, it cannot open the sodium channels because the receptors are desensitized. So acetylcholine cannot bring any depolarization and contraction in the skeletal muscle, so skeletal muscle is going to be paralyzed. In this way, saxamethonium, even it produces the initial muscle contractions, but because of the receptor desensitization, it results in the muscle paralysis. So that's why saxamethonium is called as depolarizing neuromuscular blocker. Now let us see the metabolism of the saxonyl choline. So this is the structure of the saxonyl choline, and we have seen that the saxonyl choline is having the saxonyl moiety. Just we have discussed that because of the saxonyl moiety, this drug cannot be metabolized by the acetylcholine esterase enzymes which are membrane bound at the cholinergic nerve terminals. But this drug when it is administered into the body, it can be metabolized by the plasma choline esterases which are also called as butyl choline esterases. So because of this uh, plasma choline esterases, saxamethonium is rapidly metabolized within the plasma which results in the short duration of action. So here we have to remember that saxamethonium is not metabolized at the cholinergic nerve terminals, but it is metabolized within the plasma. So this is the structure of the saxamethonium. We can observe that it is having the two choline moieties. By the action of the plasma choline esterases, this saxonyl choline can be converted to a metabolite which is having a monocholine moiety. So this metabolite is called as saxonyl monocholine then this saxonyl monocholine can be further metabolized so that uh, another choline moiety is removed and it is converted to saxonic acid. So in this way, saxonyl choline on metabolism gives the two choline molecules and one molecule of the saxonic acid. Now let us see the pharmacological actions of the saxamethonium. We have already seen that saxamethonium is metabolized by plasma choline esterases, so it is going to be rapidly depolarized and it is short acting. Saxamethonium is having an onset of action around 30 seconds, but duration of action is around 10 minutes. The short duration of action of saxamethonium is because of the plasma choline esterases. But rarely in few of the people we can observe the deficiency of this enzyme and a 
prolonged action of the sex amitonium. For example, in the homozygotes, we can observe a deficiency of this plasma cholinesterase enzyme, which results in the prolonged paralysis. Now, if we see the various organs which are affected by sex amitonium, the first one is the skeletal muscle. So already we have seen that it is a depolarizing neuromuscular blocker. So it produces the initial muscle fasciculations. So initial muscle contractions are produced because the membrane is depolarized. But because of the persistent depolarization, saxamethonium later it can produce the muscle paralysis. So skeletal muscle is going to be paralyzed by the action of the saxamethonium. So which type of muscles are initially affected? Saxamethonium can affect the small skeletal muscles like the muscles of the eye, face, limbs are initially affected and later medium muscles and finally the large muscles are affected. So large muscles like the intercostal muscles and diaphragm are finally affected by saxamethonium. Next one is on the heart. We have seen that saxamethonium acts on the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors present at the skeletal muscle that is the, it acts on the NM type of receptor that means muscular receptors. And apart from this nicotinic action, saxamethonium can also inhibit the muscanic receptors. We know the different types of muscanic receptors M1 to M5. So among these, saxamethonium can act on the M2 receptors which are present on the heart so that it can decrease the rate of contraction leading to the bradycardia. So bradycardia is one of the important effect of the saxamethonium. Another one is the eye. At the eye, the extraocular muscles are going to be contracted by the saxamethonium which may affect the intraocular pressure and because of the contraction, the intraocular pressure is going to be increased which may result in the eye pain in the patients. Now let us see the effect of the saxamethonium on the potassium levels. So at the neuromuscular junction, the saxamethonium can bind to this acetylcholine binding site so that it is going to open the sodium channels and these sodium channels produce a depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane. But this depolarization is persistent and because of this persistent depolarization, these sodium channels can also stimulate the outgoing potassium channels. So potassium can go outside so that the potassium levels in the serum may be elevated. So by the action of saxamethonium, potassium levels in the serum can be increased up to 0.5 to 1 milli equivalent per liter. This is not a significant uh, problem in the healthy people, but in the patients who are having the severe burns, trauma and severe tissue damage and tissue injury. In such case, the hyperkalemia produced by saxamethonium is very significant and which may lead to fear of the ventricular dysrhythmias. Now let us see the side effects of saxamethonium. So already we have seen the saxamethonium can act on the heart, so it decreases the rate of contraction. So one of the important side effects of the saxamethonium is the bradycardia. And it can also produce hypotension, a reduced blood pressure. And another important side effect is the prolonged paralysis. Even the saxamethonium acts for a short period, but it can produce some paralysis which is somewhat prolonged and it can lead to few of the side effects. In the patients, we can observe some rigidity in the jaw as well as some respiratory depression because the saxamethonium can cause the paralysis of the intercostal muscles and diaphragm which may lead to some respiratory depression. And particularly, this prolonged paralysis can be observed in the genetic variants as well as the few of the patients who are suffering with the liver failure. And then there is the muscle fasciculations. We know that the saxamethonium produces initial muscle fasciculations which may produce some post-operative pain. And it can also affect the eye, thereby it can increase the intraocular pressure and this is important in the patients with the glaucoma. And because of the persistent depolarization, it can also activate the potassium channels and it can elevate the serum potassium levels which is more important in the patients having the severe burns and tissue damage. And finally, one of the important side effects of this uh, saxamethonium is the malignant hyperthermia. Now let us see how this saxamethonium can produce malignant hyperthermia. So at the skeletal muscle, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are present which are closely associated with the T-tubules. So when this uh, saxamethonium binds to this nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, these T-tubules are going to be depolarized and this depolarization results in the activation of the rhinodin receptors present on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So these rhinodin receptors are responsible for the release of the calcium from the 
intracellular stores within the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So when these receptors are going to be activated, they will release a large efflux of the calcium into the skeletal muscle, which results in the contraction as well as generation of the heat. Because of this uh, initial muscle contractions, the heat is going to be produced, which can be observed as a hyperthermia, a raise in the body temperature, and which is a severe, so it is called as malignant hyperthermia. So this malignant hyperthermia is, can be controlled by inhibition of the release of the calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This can be achieved by one of the drug dantrolene. Dantrolene acts as an antagonist at the rhinodin receptors, thereby it inhibits the release of the calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and it prevents the malignant hyperthermia. And this side effect is uh, also observed with few of the other drugs like the halothane which is a IV anastic and chlorpromzine which is a antipsychotic. So whenever these drugs are combined with the saxamethonium, they can produce a severe malignant hyperthermia. Now let us see the clinical use of the saxamethonium. One of the clinical use is the tracheal intubation. So tracheal intubation is the insertion of the tube into the trachea and this should be done at a rapid rate in order to prevent the movement of the food into the pharynx. This can be done by rapid relaxation of the tracheal muscles which can be achieved by saxamethonium. So saxamethonium rapidly relaxes the tracheal muscles as well as it is short acting. So it it facilitates the insertion of the tube into the trachea. In this way, saxamethonium can be used for the few of the minor surgical procedures where the rapid skeletal muscle relaxation is required for a short duration. Similarly, this saxamethonium can also be used in the electroconvulsive therapy. In the ECT, the convulsions are treated by electrical therapy where the patient can observe few of these convulsions and these convulsions are controlled by saxamethonium as it produces the muscle paralysis. So in this way, saxamethonium is a depolarizing neuromuscular blocker which is rapidly acting as well as shortly acting. So it can be used for the few of the minor surgical procedures where the muscle relaxation is required rapidly as well as for a short period. So particularly saxamethonium can be used along with the IV anastics in order to produce a rapid muscle relaxation. So that's about this depolarizing your muscular blockers. If you like this video, please subscribe to our channel and share this video with your friends and post your comments in the comment box. Thank you for watching this video.